Today on Government Matters, the Principal Deputy Director of the Office of National Intelligence joins us for an exclusive interview on her top priorities. We look at the challenges she's facing and how the community is using emerging technologies to counter evolving threats. She shares her plans to recruit a younger and more diverse workforce for the intelligence community. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. The intelligence community recently announced that it will be working with commercial industries to protect our national security from the growing number of threats by using cutting edge tools and technologies. Stacy Dixon is the principal deputy director of national intelligence, the nation's number two intelligence official. Deputy Director Dixon, it is so nice to have you here. Welcome. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. I, I want to start with how the intelligence community is using new technologies to position itself for future threats. Fantastic question. And it's really interesting when you think about the technologies we need because they aren't necessarily that different than the same types of technologies you might see that are out in the world. We just use them for different purposes. We may need them to be either faster or uh, more sensitive, uh, larger or smaller, depending on what the application is. But really, all the things that are out there that are being produced by industry, uh, produced out there in academia, would be useful for, for the intelligence community. We use them for collecting information, so something that is listening, something that is recording, something that is uh, observing or collecting photos or pictures. All of those things will contribute to our ability to understand what's happening in the world so that we can provide policymakers the information that they need to help uh, determine the policies that uh, the country will use in interacting with the rest of the world. You know, one of the big emerging technologies is facial recognition, yes. right? So that's really out there. iPhones use them. I wonder how that affects, you know, spy operations and, and collection of information. It is, it's really interesting to see how when the technology changes and matures out in just the regular world, how it does impact the way that we interact on the intelligence side and how we do our work. Something like uh, facial recognition technology fantastic applications to be able to, for example, from a very far distance, be able to observe that someone is uh, someone who potentially has done something to harm someone in the past, something, someone who has done something to harm the country in the past, to catch them at a distance is wonderful. Where it becomes more difficult for the intelligence community, of course, is we also rely on being able to uh, surreptitiously go places to be able to go and collect the information that we need within intelligence and certainly having all of the cameras around has made us have to change our tradecraft but we are adapting and adjusting the tradecraft to be able to still operate in environments even when there are a lot of cameras or recording devices and locations. I, I want to ask you about uh, protecting intellectual property mm -hmm. because that's a big issue for private companies. Yes. They're innovating but then their ideas get stolen. So how is the intel community dealing with that issue? Some of it is awareness. We will work with, with, uh, with Homeland Security, with the FBI, and also go out and, and share what we know about threats to technology, whether it is someone who is working at a lab, someone who is working in academia, who is taking the, the intellectual property of individuals who have developed these capabilities. Uh, we try to educate people so they know what the threats are, they know how the information can be stolen. A lot of it is taken through the internet, through cyber, you know, cyber, uh, through, hi through hacking, uh, cyber attacks, things like that. Raising the awareness of the individuals who have information that could be stolen is step one. Making sure that they've got their cyber defenses strong is another step. Uh, and just making them aware that you know the, the, the things that they are developing are very valuable to others in other places who might seek to use the, the technology in ways that are harmful. Just raising that awareness, I think, also helps them understand what they need to protect and what they can do better in terms of being able to make sure that their information is more secure, whether it's on their computers or whether it's on, on hard copy, uh, just making sure that they understand that it is their role also to, to protect it while we will also do our part. You know, part of the intel's job is to kind of say, hey, there's uh, a potential attack coming, there's right. something going on. Does that work for cyber as well? I mean, can you say, hey, it looks like there might be a ransomware attack coming against this piece of critical infrastructure? We do have, uh, there is, there's a role that the intelligence community plays and then that there's a role that the rest of the federal government plays in doing just that. With respect to the intelligence community, we are more focused on those contractors that are actually working for us and with us. The uh, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, are definitely paying attention to the rest of the, the companies that are in there and providing that information. We may go and do joint briefings if we know that there's attack, an attack forthcoming. We may see signatures in the the networks that we're monitoring that also let us know something is happening and we're 
creating better mechanisms to be able to communicate that to the company so that they can better protect themselves. And how are you working with private companies, especially smaller innovative companies and universities to really bring in and leverage their innovation? There have been a number of, of ways that we're trying to communicate better what our priorities and requirements are. So what is it that we're trying to develop? Where would we benefit from having people in academia and industry come forward and, and show us the capabilities that they've already developed? So part of it is just making sure that they're aware of what we're interested in buying. The other side is we do also within the federal government writ large and, and specifically in the intelligence community fund, we have grants that fund uh, innovative research. We have relationships that we've developed with a lot of universities to actually help them understand particular intelligence problems and they can then tailor their solutions to those problems. So we are trying to figure out a way to make sure that anyone who has a capability that would benefit the intelligence community it knows how to uh, make us aware of what those capabilities are and also knows how to work with us better through our contracting process, which can be a little more cumbersome than many of the small companies and academia is used to. And I know that your office it doesn't just want to follow the emerging technologies right. that are coming out, but you want to shape the science and technology landscape. Tell me how you're doing that. That's absolutely true. We will be coming out with a larger intelligence community science and technology strategy that helps articulate some of the capabilities uh, that we're looking for, whether it is in the realm of satellites or whether it is analytic tools or whether it is other collection things, other sensors that need, we need developed. That will give many in, in industry and academia kind of a roadmap of if you develop something in this, in this, in this space, we would be interested in knowing about it. Um, in addition, we also have innovation centers that many of the organizations are developing, whether it's CIA labs or NGA's Moonshot Labs or the NRO recently opened up a collaboration space where we can have better interactions with industry and academia at an unclassified level so that they can help us to achieve whatever the missions require by developing those capabilities for us. Okay, we're going to take a quick pause and then we'll come back and continue our conversation. Coming next, more of my conversation with Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, Stacey Dixon, about the latest initiatives out of her office. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our discussion with Stacey Dixon. She is the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, the nation's number two intelligence official. Stacey, we're talking about cyber in the last segment and as that cyber threat landscape really evolves and hackers get more sophisticated, mm -hmm. do you feel the intelligence community really has the resources and the skills needed to combat that? That's a great question. So resource-wise, I think as the threat grows, more investment is needed and we are in the process of making more of those investments. The skills is an interesting question because I think we for many years have talked about the lack of having enough people in cybersecurity, not just for the intelligence community, not just for the federal government in general across all of industry. So we're looking forward to having uh, universities produce more uh, students that are uh, uh, versed in cybersecurity, uh, able to do the counter of the hacking, and we're looking forward to having more of those actually want to come and work in the intelligence community as well. So I think we are working towards having the resources we need. We definitely understand that the threat is increasing and growing and that we need to put more focus there and that is we're, in, we're making plans to do that. So what is your strategy to recruit that next generation of intelligence officers and high tech employees? Part of it is making sure that people understand that working for the federal government, working for the intelligence community is really meaningful and worthwhile and that there are a lot of opportunities for a lot of different kinds of skill sets. As I travel around talking to high school students and talking to college students, many of them have no idea about intelligence, the intelligence community other than what they've seen on television or in the movies. And there is so much more to offer than just sort of what you see in sort of the spy space that makes it onto the big screen. So making sure they understand what the opportunities are, the kinds of challenges that work we're working on and at the end of the day our goal is to help keep the country safe and that we want people of all backgrounds all, all disciplines all experiences to come and work for us because that makes us a stronger community you're talking to high school students you're really trying to start young <laughs> we are and, and it's really interesting there I was uh, out, out visiting just a couple of months or a month ago some high school students who were working a project where they were doing analysis on some of the same topics that we analyze in the intelligence community. So seeing the thought process that they were already being taught in one of the programs that they were involved in was really impressive. So I have great hope for high school students who learn about intelligence early and then want to come and make that a career later. 
And you mentioned diversity, equity, inclusion. What are you doing specifically in that area? So one of the things that we're doing is expanding our outreach to other schools that had traditionally not seen as much, seen as many visits by the intelligence community. So whether that is a historically black colleges and universities or minority serving institutions. Um, as a director of national intelligence, Haynes recently visited Florida International, and Florida International University. I was out at Harris Stowe State University talking to the students about possible careers in intelligence. I think part of the barrier is just people are not as aware that this is really a great place to work, the intelligence community at large, and that there are so many opportunities within it. So making them more aware and, and then encouraging them to think about a career in public service. We sort of do two things while we're out visiting. So how do they react to you? What's the reaction been? The reaction's been pretty exciting, actually. They, they, have, they have been surprised by the types of things that we talk about. When we talk about the types of capabilities that we're invested in, the types of technology that we're looking at, it's always very eye-opening for them. But we also talk about the fact that we are like every other business. We have other traditional assignments, right? We need people in human resources. We need people who are uh, you know, there with a the budget figure. So we need the same types of people that will, would work in other places. We've just opened their eyes to so this is another possibility where they can apply their skill sets. And then we talk about our internship programs, which is a great way for uh, college students to get in the door, to come try us out for a little while to see whether the intelligence community is something that they might want to focus on. But isn't there a big barrier to coming into the intelligence community given the highly classified nature of the work? And that's the other part of what we have to help explain a little bit better, that there is a security clearance process and that the earlier they make a decision to apply, the better, especially when we're talking to seniors who are about a month from graduating, it's a little too late for them to think that they're gonna have an offer right when they graduate. So we really have to back up that time schedule. So talking to them earlier in their college career helps them to know that they've gotta put their applications in sooner. We're also working very, very uh, uh, diligently to try to reduce the timelines that it takes for the hiring and security clearance process. So I'm hopeful in the future that those will be less barriers because having to wait that long has been a, a quite, uh, we've, we've lost a lot of great candidates by them not being able to be able to wait through the entire process. So Stacey, it's been 20 years since 9-11. Um, do you think that the Intel community has needed to shift focus from counterterrorism to you know, what's called the near peer adversaries, China and Russia. Yes, and we are we are also in the process of doing that. Um, my, being mindful though that the, the the counter or the terrorism threat has not completely gone away, making sure that they are there are no threats that actually make it here to the homeland, that no attacks make it to the homeland is still an important consideration for us. It's still something that we're focused on. But we do recognize that there are a lot of other things happening in the world, a lot of competitors who are uh, trying to you know replace us as sort of the, one of the leading nations in the world. Uh, we're trying to bring in sort of authoritarian governments and authoritarian perspectives as opposed to democratic perspectives that we might be talking about that are trying to have relationships in a lot of different countries in the world uh, and doing so in ways that are frankly harmful to those countries in terms of being you know beholden uh, to large debt uh, having to uh, having to house uh, uh, technologies or capabilities or bases of these other countries really will have an impact on the nations and so yes we are definitely trying to focus not only on allies and those who work with us but trying to make sure that we are still investing in what we need to be so that we can remain at the top of the the tier when it comes to technology when it comes to the economy when it comes to other innovation so speaking of uh, shifting focus a little bit how are you responding to the effects of climate change. Thank you. Uh, well, one of the first things is making sure that we are listening to the scientists, making sure that we are listening to what the data is actually telling us, and then making those investments that are necessary to provide alternatives to the, the polluters, the alternatives to the uh, oil-based products that are partially what is causing the challenges that we're having right now. Uh, making sure that we are investing in energy efficiency uh, is part of the larger government. On the intelligence side, it's really learning what we can. We have great capabilities to monitor that we've been monitoring for years. Those same capabilities, although they've been focused on intelligence, have also collected a lot of information about how the climate's been changing. Being able to bring that to bear with scientists that they have more complete data sets is one thing that we've done as well. And, and the instability that climate Correct. catastrophes can cause around the world that will affect our national security. Exactly. People will people will have, there will be conflicts over water, conflicts over food, conflicts over, of course, resources like whether it's uh, oil or whether it is other natural resources. People will fight over those things. So knowing where changes are happening in, in countries, knowing where changes are happening in regions of the world helps us to plan better, helps us to inform our policymakers so that we can perhaps figure out how to get in front of some of the things that might be happening so that, uh, if possible, 
help them, you know, help countries see that they're coming to, so that they can prevent them. Uh, worst case, making sure that our policymakers know that it's possible that these things will happen on the horizon. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick pause again, and we'll come back and continue. Great. Coming next, we wrap up our conversation with Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, Stacey Dixon. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here with Stacey Dixon. She's the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, the nation's number two intelligence official. Stacey, how does the Office of uh, Director of National Intelligence fit within the larger intelligence community? So the Office of, Office, Office of the Director of National Intelligence has two main roles. Um, the Director of National Intelligence herself is the Principal Intelligence Advisor for the President. So there's a part of our organization that is, is uh, supporting her, making sure that we are coordinating around the community, getting that integrated intelligence picture on whatever the topic is, uh, making sure that we are also shaping and guiding the types of information that is being brought in. We'll make sure that the pres president's priorities, for example, are well known throughout all of the agencies that they can bring to bear their particular uh, disciplines to be able to collect the information. The other side of it is providing oversight over the community itself, the 18 elements of the intelligence community, making sure that we are staying uh, stay on top of the types of things that they're investing in, looking at their human capital and their, their HR policies and processes, looking at all the things that govern each of the different organizations and making sure that they're following the guidance that we've set forth to kind of make us more unified as a community so that we can actually move forward together and provide the intelligence that's needed. So ODNI was created in uh, 2005. It was a recommendation of the 9-11 Commission, Correct. essentially because there was a failure of coordination and connecting the dots leading up to that attack. Is it working now? I would say it's definitely working. If you look over the, t over the time period and you see the types of things that we've been able to do together as a community, uh, I don't think that those folks that, that created the organization, that decided it needed to be there, I think they would be very pleased with what we've seen. However, having said that, times do continue to change and we can't be static. We need to continue to, to modify ourselves so that we can keep up with the threats that are out there. But if you look at the amount of integration, you look at the fact that we're able to come together to provide not only great solutions to some of the challenges that we're facing, but also that insight that the policymakers and decision makers need, I would say that the bringing together the community and having an office of the Director of National Intelligence on top has definitely been in keeping with what those, uh, those founders envisioned. So you've said that uh, your specific role is as a problem solver and a bridge builder. Can you explain that? I can. Uh, I'll start with the bridge builder part first because I think that it's one of the, the largest roles. We have a community of all of the deputies of the intelligence community. We get together regularly to actually solve problems, to highlight things that no one particular agency can solve on its own, where you really need the community coming together. And whether that is the large challenges we have with new competitors, or whether that is even focusing on how do you now use the resources that you have remaining on counterterrorism, for example. So we'll come together and have those kind of conversations so that we're more efficiently putting our resources against the threats. Uh, problem solver. You're an engineer. You don't even I, need to explain I, that one. I, I, I am an engineer, and so I'm always seeking problems to solve. One of the things, though, that in this seat that we can make sure that's happening is as we commit to something, for example, we've committed to security clearance reform. How are all the different agencies going about that? How are we doing that in a collective space so that we can actually have the kind of outcomes, which is lower, reduced timelines, while still having the quality outcomes that we need? Uh, if, as we look at the way that we're investing in science and technology, we're all recognizing that we need to work more with industry. How do we do that more effectively as a community as opposed to having 18 different elements all approaching the same companies and having the same conversations? So by bringing people together, I feel that we can solve the problems a lot more effectively. I, I want to ask you about your personal story because you were born and raised in D.C. and I know your parents were very accomplished people, but what was your path like going from, you know, living in, and growing up in D.C. to a Ph.D. in engineering and then to the highest levels of the intelligence community. It, my, journey is, my journey is always fun to talk about. I started off just loving science and, and science and math and knowing that I wanted to do something with those particular topics. And I didn't know whether that was going to be medicine. At the time, I didn't really think too much about engineering, but that is the path that I ended up taking in college. Once I was there, I was just open to different opportunities. I thought that I was going to pursue a career in academia, but as I went through, I decided that there were other things I wanted to be able to do, applying the science and technology principles, the sort of the foundational uh, hypothesis solving and problem solving. And I found the intelligence community 
realized that I could apply those skills, but also learn so many other ones by being a part of the community and just took a series of, of jobs that provided me skill sets that I think have made me an attractive candidate for some of these higher level positions. So uh, I'm very thankful of the journey that I've had and it's, it's, been, it's been great so far and I look forward to seeing what else I can contribute going forward. Well, Stacy, I want you to close with your best recruitment pitch. Yeah. Why should somebody work for the intelligence community? The intelligence community has endless opportunities. There are so many different types of jobs within it. There's so many different skill sets that we need and opportunities to collaborate. At the end of the day, our goal is to keep the country safe and to make sure that our senior most decision makers, our senior most policy makers have the information they need to help them make policies that actually make sense for this country and help position us in the world. Being able to contribute to that on a daily basis is just wonderful and uh, very, very meaningful. And if you're, if you're looking for a career that has meaning, that will still challenge you and allow you to give you a lot of opportunities to learn new things, the intelligence community is the place for you. Well, you, you sold me, but I already have a job. <laughs> Stacy. thank you so much for coming by. Such a, such a nice conversation with you. I appreciate it. Thank you as well. I appreciate it. If you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's on our website at govmatters.tv. And listen to our Government Matters podcast. It's available on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. You can also find every episode on our website. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.